My name is Victoria Reinhardt. I'm Ramsey County Commissioner representing District 7, and that is uh, the cities of White Bear Lake, North St. Paul, Maplewood, and the Hillcrest neighborhood in St. Paul. I'm also a member of the Clean Water Council um, dealing with water issues across the state. I would like to begin by thanking the co-hosts for this evening, the Metropolitan Council, USGS, the DNR, Representative Carol McFarlane, Mayor Joe Emerson, Metropolitan Council members Harry Melander and Sandy Rummel, and White Bear Lake Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Chair Scott Mueller is here, as well as other members of the Chamber. First, I want to give you a little bit of information about tonight's meeting. This is an educational event in order to explore potential solutions to the water supply challenges that we face. We must first understand the problem in order to um, understand what those possible solutions would be. Experts are here from the USGS, the DNR, and the Metropolitan Council, and they are going to share their knowledge of our water supply system with you. Tonight is not designed to be a debate about solutions. All of us, including the experts presenting tonight, need more information because before we can discuss solutions. There will be an opportunity to explore solutions at a future meeting. Uh, that is very important here because this is the first in a series. This is to get the base information. I guess what I'd like to do then is, first of all, just say thank you for being engaged residents, being willing to spend your evening, this beautiful evening, learning about our region's water supply, and for your interest in finding a solution to the challenges that we all face. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's presenters. From the DNR, hydrologist Michael McDonald. He will be our first presenter and he will cover groundwater basics. From the Metropolitan Council, we have Ali El Hassan. He manages the water supply planning department of the Metropolitan Council and he'll be the second presenter and will focus specifically on groundwater in the Twin Cities metro area. And then last but not least, Perry Jones is a hydrologist with the United States uh, Geological Survey, USGS. Uh, and he will present information specific to the Northeast Twin Cities area. Mr. McDonald, I will pass it off to you at this point. Good evening, everyone. I am a hydrologist with the, DN with the DNR, and we're going to talk about groundwater basics. Groundwater is our hidden resource, and I want to kind of describe in 20 minutes or less, everything you need to know about how water moves underground. So we're going to get started here, this way, there we go. First off, what is groundwater? Groundwater is water that's under the ground. It's as simple as that. <laughs> it is not puddles sitting on top of the ground. It is not the moist soil you get when you dig in your garden. It's, it's deeper than that. It's where the soils are really saturated, where the rock is really saturated. And the only way we can really get it out is with pumps like this. But before we talk more about groundwater, I want to talk about surface water. Why? Because we understand surface water. When we see this stream is low, we say, wow, the stream is low. When we see the lake is flooding, we say, the lake is flooding. We see the groundwater. Well, do you see the groundwater? Can you tell what the groundwater is doing in this picture? No, it's underground. It's out of sight, it's out of mind. So how do we know what groundwater is doing? To see groundwater, we use wells. In this case, a well like this. You can tell right away that it's not as obvious as what the surface water is. When I look at a lake and you've been there for a while, you see if it's been up and down. I can't tell what, what's going on in this well. So wells are our only clue to what's going on in the groundwater. They are limited in that, based on the geology, they may be representative of an area for 100 feet around it. It may be representative of a mile around it. So wells are necessary. They're our only real tool. But they are limited in what they can tell. <coughs> now we're going to step even further back and talk about water in general. How does water move through our environment? This is the hydrologic cycle. Many of you are probably very familiar with this. Briefly. Water falls from the sky as rain or snow, runs into lakes or streams, or soaks into the ground. The water that soaks into the ground continues to soak in and eventually becomes groundwater. 
Water also comes out of the lakes and streams, soaks through the soils, and becomes groundwater. But the groundwater also moves up into the lakes and streams. And it gets evaporated back up, and the, the whole cycle starts over and over. The thing about groundwater and surface water is it, it can move, even the course of a stream, you can have water moving from the groundwater into the stream, and further down the stream, you can have water moving from the stream back into the groundwater. Likewise with lakes. And that can even happen over a year. It can shift how it's moving. So it's not a simple, straightforward, it's always going into the river, or there's always a spring feeding the lake. It changes over time and how the conditions are. So what is an aquifer? I've been talking about groundwater, but aquifers are what groundwater is in. And as a simple solution, an aquifer is a sponge. If you can think of it like that, you're doing really well. And the reason uh, we want to call it a sponge is because a sponge has holes. It soaks up water. If you squeeze it, the water comes out. It's very similar to what an, aqu an aquifer will do. It will hold water. It will, water will come out when we put a well into it. Water will go back into it when water seeps through the soils and the lakes. Aquifers are top, not typically as squishy as sponges, though. So here's our list of terms. And these are the terms that you're typically going to use when we talk about groundwater. So I'm going to go through them. And an aquifer is soil or rock that contains water and releases it in appreciable amounts. And that's important because an aquifer that can supply enough water for a house may not supply enough water for a city. So in an appreciable amount, it can supply the house. It can't supply the city. So you have to know how big our aquifer is and how much water it can release to call it a good aquifer, an OK aquifer. A confining layer, a confining bed, or an aquitard are all the same. They mean the same thing. And it's soil or rock that does not contain water or does not release it in appreciable amounts. And clay is an excellent example of something that would be a confining layer. Water just doesn't move through it very well. A well. What is a well? A well is a hole or shaft sunk into the ground to obtain water. In the state of Minnesota, for at least the past 20 years, it's going to be a steel or PVC pipe open at the bottom in the aquifer that you're looking to get water from. In, other, in, in, in the past, you could have had a well that goes through many aquifers. You can't do that anymore. It's just not allowed by code. Fin or recharge. Recharge is replenishing the aquifer by the absorption of water. Many times it's precipitation soaking through the ground, maybe coming out of streams and rivers. And finally, withdrawal is removing water from an aquifer. So these are kind of our basic terms as we're going through this, as we're talking tonight, as you're visiting the different tables. These are kind of what we're trying to get across when we talk about these terms. Now we get into the fun part. Aquifer types. We have two basic aquifer types, a water table aquifer, and a confined aquifer. The water table is usually the first aquifer that we encounter when we go into the ground. It is anywhere in Minnesota, it's anywhere from one foot to 200 feet down, depending on geology. Water table wells are typically most affected by rainwater and drought, immediately affected by either one of those. Water comes up and goes down, it can go down very easily. You can see that is representative of the water in the water table, meaning that's the level. That's where the water is in the soils in the rock around our well. Now down below it is a confined aquifer. And a confined aquifer is an aquifer usually, well, that is kind of compressed, either by the weight of the material above it or maybe the water coming in from the far ends that is being recharged, and it pressurizes the water in that aquifer so that when we put a well into it, the water level rises. It rises to the potentiometric surface, which is, I love that word, it's just fun to say. The potentiometric surface is the level that the water in that aquifer wants to go to. This is an artesian well. We call an artesian well is any well that the water level rises above the top of the aquifer. So you see down here the aquifer is, is down at the bottom, that's the top of the aquifer. 
Now in the water table well, the top of the aquifer is the water level that we measure in the well. But in our artesian well, the water level has risen quite a ways up, and that's indicative of a confined system. Now you look over here to our flowing artesian well, and a flowing artesian well is where the well is constructed in the confined aquifer, but the pipe doesn't go all the way up to that potentiometric surface. So in areas where you get that, you're going to get a flowing well. The water's just going to come out of the pipe automatically, just on its own. The, the reason you don't build a pipe to, to make it stay in there is because in some places that could be a 20-foot high pipe on top of the ground, and nobody wants to use a pipe that's that high. Flowing artesian wells are not common in Minnesota, but they're not uncommon in Minnesota. And we find them a lot along the bluffs of the rivers, the Mississippi, the St. Croix, the Minnesota. So these are our two aquifer types. And how the water is in those, the water reacts differently when we pump it, when rainwater comes into it, when water moves through it. Another way to think of an aquifer is as a savings account. You have the, your balance in your bank account, which would be similar to the water level that we measure in the aquifer. The aquifer can store a certain amount of water. Withdrawals are just pumping what we take out of the aquifer. Recharge would be like an income, a savings deposit. You put money into the account. We can know pretty well what the withdrawals are if we can measure the pumping. And we at the DNR, for big wells, we, are, we get that data from the, from the people that pump the wells every year. The recharge is harder because we have to know what the rainfall is in the area. We have to know how much it soaks through the ground. We have to know how fast it goes through the ground. And then you've got some other competing problems like water. The groundwater is going to move through the aquifer on its own. So it's coming from here and going to there. So there's a few more things going in. And we can, the recharge, as I said, is a little harder for us to measure. And we're working on trying to develop ways to better understand that so we know what the balance is, how things are moving throughout the aquifers. One other thing to remember about groundwater is that it's water. It flows downhill. Simple as that. Now this diagram, again, has got a lot going on, but it's, it's a good one because you can see how our water kind of moves through the aquifer systems. I've been talking about the recharge. So water, say rain comes down and falls over near the stream, and in a couple of days it might move through the water, the, the water table aquifer, and get into that stream, or it might take a couple of years. Likewise over here, it might come out in a couple of days in that pump well. It might take a couple of years. In the center there, if the water falls kind of there, and it makes its way down through the water table well, water table aquifer, excuse me, through the confining layer, into that deeper, the first confined aquifer. And then it can move through there, and that could take centuries to get there. And then maybe it continues to move downward and goes into that deepest confined layer, and that can take millennia. In the Mount Simon aquifer, here in the Twin Cities areas, we have, wa we have measured the age of the water from 10 to 30,000 years old. So it takes a long time to get down there. Now, what happens when we pump these? This is an example of the two different well types. And when we pump the water table well, and we've got one there and one on the other side of the stream, the water's going to go into the well. Because what happens when we pump is the pump basically draws the water down because it's, it's taking it out. And the water level drops. So the water's going to want to flow downhill. So at this point, the pump is the lowest point, and it flows downhill. So if it's coming from that way, <laughs> if it's going that way, it's going to the pump, but it's no longer going to the stream. So if the pump was not pumping, the water in the water table well would probably go past it and into the stream. Likewise, on that other one, on the far edge, when that's pumping, that may be drawing water from the stream. And that's just the properties of the water moving through a system. Now down below in our confined aquifer, kind of the same thing is happening. It's, co it's collecting water, capturing water that's coming and going that direction, but it's also starting to pull water back. 
the, the gradient flow, the natural flow would be to that direction. But with the pump going, the water's gonna come back. Also, you can see it's coming down through the water table aquifer, through our confining layer, our aquitard, and into the confined system. So that may not be happening if that pump was not pumping. Or it may be happening much slower than it is. So we're influencing the way the water is moving under the ground. This is kind of a close-up of that downward movement. This is called the cone of depression because once the pump fires up, this is how the water in, in the soils and the rock tends to go. It goes down to the bottom of that, the well. Now, in this situation, the, the, the dotted line would be what we call the static water level. If nothing was going on, there was no pumping going on, that's where the water would be. And in that case, the domestic well would, would be in the water. And if they pumped, they probably wouldn't affect the system that great, and they'd continue to have water. That's why they put the well there. Now, in this case, somebody came in with a high volume pumping well, an irrigation well, a municipal well, an industrial well, and they're pumping a lot more water out. Okay but they've drawn the whole water level down. And it's now drawn down so far that the domestic well is out of water. In situations like this, the person that has the high volume pumping well is responsible for making sure that that domestic homeowner, that domestic well has drinking water. So they could drill them a new well, they could lower the pump in the, in the well if it were necessary. They could hook them up to city water. There's a number of things they could do, but they are responsible for making sure that that domestic well has water. Because in the state of Minnesota, everyone has the, uh, can take groundwater. Every, it's, it's, it's a shared resource and everyone has access to it. But we also have a series of priorities on what is the most important aspect, you know, who is the most important user of our groundwater? And the domestic use is our most important use. Whether it's an individual private homeowner's well, if it's a municipal well, the, the water that's going to the households for drinking water and basic use is the most important priority. So, there it is, groundwater basics. Everything you need to know, right? If you remember a couple of things. Groundwater flows downhill, just like regular water. We have two types of aquifer systems, a water table and a confined, and they both react differently when we pump them. If you think of aquifers as a sponge, you get the basic feel for how water is gonna move through that aquifer. Remember, as we can take water out, we can put water in, we can keep water there. The bank balance is just a general good idea of how, how the systems work. So now, I have five minutes to go through Minnesota groundwater. We've been talking in general, and we're gonna focus later, the other speakers are gonna focus in on the metro area and then on this area in specific. But in, across the state of Minnesota, we have six groundwater provinces. And those provinces are determined by geology, basically. What, is the, what are the soils there? What is the bedrock there? And Throughout central and southern, southeastern Minnesota, the, the aquifer, the bedrock especially, the bedrock aquifers are pretty much the same. And, and Ali will be talking a bit about that. So I'm gonna jump us over to the west side of the state, the western province. Goes from Canada to Iowa, right along the Dakota borders. The groundwater here, the bedrock in this area, just not conducive to having aquifers at all. You might get a little bit of water out of them, but it's really not very good and people don't typically use it. The aquifers that are available are in these soils above it and they're limited, they're small, and they're isolated. As an example, these are the major aquifers near Moorhead, the blue blobs there. You'll notice they aren't connected. They're long and narrow, they're relatively deep, but they're still limited. The city of Moorhead used to get their water out of the Buffalo Aquifer, which is the one closest to Moorhead there. They noticed as they were pumping that the levels were going down. And in some places and sometimes rather dramatically. 
And they knew that if they continued to pump, that they would, they could run that aquifer dry and then they would be out of water completely. So they shifted and they have now gotten some of their water from the Red River. And they use the Red River and the Buffalo Aquifer in combination to ensure that they have a water supply. Moorhead is lucky because it has that surface water source. Other cities in western Minnesota and southwestern Minnesota don't have that option. So they have to go further afield to get water. They may have to buy it from a neighbor. They may have to use water that's not as good a quality. So that's part of when we talk about aquifer systems and solutions and problems, we can't think of one solution fits all across the state because our groundwater provinces are so different and the abilities and the problems in them are different. And so we have to kind of focus on what, there's, what is there what we can do and individualize solutions for those particular areas. So here's a true flowing artesian well and if all our water came out that way it'd be a lot easier to get our water. Good evening. My name is Ali El Hassan. I'm the uh, manager of water supply planning for the Metropolitan Council. And this presentation I will talk about the groundwater in the seven county metro area. I will start with some background information. As of 2010, we have 3 million people or about 3 million people living in the metropolitan area. The water use for the 3 million people is about 450 million gallons a day. To put that in perspective, that's about two and a half metrodome filled with water in one day. So, what are the sources for this water supply? How we are supplying this demand in the metro area? We have two sources. The first one is our groundwater. The second one is our surface water. The current use shows that we are using about 24% surface water, less than one third of the population use surface water for their water supply, while the majority of the population in the metro area, they are using groundwater. So this, this shift in or, or this current use reflects a shift in the balance between surface water and groundwater over the years in the metro area. This diagram in front of you, this, this graph shows the ratio of surface water used to groundwater in the metro area. The green is surface water, the blue is groundwater. Somewhere in the end, at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, we started using more surface water, more groundwater, I mean, rather than using the surface water. And the reason for that, um, earlier we started developing in the core cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis, very close to the Mississippi River. And that's where they built all their system based on surface water. And that's how they utilized all of that until the 80s when we start developing outside the core cities spreading out to the suburbs and where we're starting being physically far away from the river and the only solution for us is groundwater. It's easy, accessible, clean and let's drill wells. But that increased reliance on groundwater has different impacts on our resources. Looking into our aquifers which is Mike talked about the different aquifers we are having in the uh, state of Minnesota as well as the metropolitan area. And as Mike mentioned in, the, in, in his presentation that the only way we look into groundwater is through wells. The Department of Natural Resources have uh, monitoring wells around this, the state as well as the metro area. These figures, those three figures are um, water level change over years from those, from three monitoring wells in the metro area. You can see clearly there is the seasonal change between summer and winter. When you have summer, people pumping, groundwater goes down. When you stop pumping, groundwater recovers back. But if you look in the long record, the historic record, and, and the first graph goes back to 1945, you can see a clear downward trend of decline in our aquifer. 
but sometimes the impacts will be visible. And I know that all of you are aware of those pictures. When we increase relying on groundwater, we start seeing impact on our surface water also, because those two are one resource, surface water and groundwater. And we start seeing impacts on our lakes, we start seeing impacts in our streams. And all of you are aware of this. So, as Mike used the sponge, I would like to use an analogy of a cheesecake to describe the layers of aquifers we are having here. And I hope that you'll like this, because it will go soon. So, let's think about the metro area as a cheese, as a layered cheesecake, or layered chocolate cake. Sorry for that. So, take a knife and from west to east, cut this cheesecake or chocolate cake, and this is what you see, the different layers of our aquifers that we have in the metropolitan area. As Mike mentioned, we have great variability on those aquifers. Even within the same aquifer, you have great variability. I will give an example from this uh, cross-section or this cake slice. The Prairie de Duchenne aquifer, which is one of the most used aquifers in the metro area, does not exist in the western part of our metro area. While the Mount Simon Hinkley exists all over the metro area. Talking about depth to groundwater, depth to Mount, Mount Simon Hinkley in the eastern part of the metro area is about four Fauché Tower, about 1,200 feet. You go west, it's about two Fauché Towers, 800, in some places it's 400. Within the same aquifer, we have different characteristics. Talking about water quality, talking about productivity, and talking about many other characteristics that each one of those aquifers. So we are dealing with great variability on those characteristics in the metro area, as well as in the greater Minnesota. So, as Mike mentioned that, we pump groundwater through our wells. And I thought this is a very interesting slide showing how many wells we are having in the metro area. Two types of wells are drilled, mainly in the metro area. One we call the public or municipal wells. We have 800 of them in the metro area, and in this map, they are indicated by the blue dots. While we have the other type of wells that people use are domestic wells or private wells. And under private wells, there is uh, about 60,000 private wells in the metro area. Those are indicated with the red color in this. Uh, and you can see in some places we have many of them that they cover the, uh, the, the underground layer from, from this map. So we have 60,000 of private wells. And most of those wells, 55,000 of them, are mainly domestic use wells. We have about 10% of that, and, and about 5,000 of those are mainly for industries and big users. We talked about the Prairie du Chien aquifer, and I, I know that it has been in the news a lot. People are wondering, what's the Prairie du Chien aquifer? Uh, why it's in the news that much? It's the most productive aquifer in the metro area. It's most accessible. The water quality is comparatively good, and that's why it's tapped by most of the municipalities in the metro area. This map shows all the municipalities that uh, use the Prairie du Chien aquifer as a source of their water supply indicated by the blue highlighted communities. The dark blue communities in this map, they are the communities that use the Prairie du Chien as the only source of water supply in the metro area. And some of those communities are growing and expected to grow further in the future in the metro area. So looking into the future, and for us as a planning agency, we look into the future, and we looked into 
our projected population by 2030 in the metro area. We are expecting about 3.5 million. Another half a million people are expected to move to the metro area, are projected to move into the metro area. That will result in increase of water demand. Instead of we were pumping 450 right now, or we are using 450 right now, we'll be using 580 million gallons a day by 2030. Putting that in perspective, we are adding another metrodome. 80% of that water is going to be coming from groundwater if we continue business as usual. If we continue the same trend that we have been doing in the, since the 80s and take that into the future and continue relying on our groundwater as the main source of water supply to meet all the future demand, we are going to increase our pumping to 400, 400, uh, 450 million gallons a day. So the question comes to us, what will be the impact in the water levels in our aquifers? What will be the impacts of our aquifers when we increase pumping by this amount to accommodate all the future population? In the metro area, in the Metropolitan Council, we develop tools to help us at least predict the impact on the aquifers and the impact on our um, uh, aquifers and the change in the water levels in the aquifer. One of those is a groundwater flow model or groundwater model that will help us understand what will be the impact of changing different scenarios in the future. What will be, as example, the impact of those half a million people moving into the metro area and relying on groundwater. The map in front of you is the map of the Prairie du Chien aquifer. And the blue color indicates more decline in our aquifers than what we have today. The darker the blue, the greater the impact. And in some places, we're going to see impact of 40 feet or more of decline from where we have today. So this is significant. And, and as you see, you see some red in the map. The red indicates that in that area, we lost about 50% of the available water in that aquifer in that location, which will impact the productivity of the aquifer at that location. So I was hoping to end my pre presentation with a better slide than this one. But I think that uh, if we continue business as usual, we are getting ourselves into big trouble. Uh, we have to change course. This is a good time to do that. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Perry Jones. I'm a hydrologist. I work for the US Geological Survey. And I'll present today uh, some of the groundwater issues with the Northeast metro area. And just to let everyone know what we're looking at, we're talking area basically from about Forest Lake down to North St. Paul, then over to Shoreview, and then over to Big, uh, Big Marine Lake in Grant Township. And so with this presentation, I'm hoping to address uh, three questions. Uh, one is, where does our water come from? The water we drink, where is it coming from? Um, and then, where does the groundwater, the, or the well water we, we pump, come from? And then finally, why do we see in some lakes in the Northeast Metro, we see the water levels low, while in other lakes, they're high, and we don't see any impact. Where is the water we use it coming from? In the Northeast Metro, most of the water we're using is coming from groundwater. Um, there are two di different types of wells. We have high capacity wells, and we have lower capacity users. And the high capacity users are ones which we have wells that pump more than a million gallons per year. And these typically are municipalities as well as uh, large commercial operations and golf courses. Um, and what we can see from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources takes uh, records and keeps records for these uh, water withdrawals from these wells that, um, and for, for the communities. We see that 99% of that water is coming from wells or groundwater, whereas about 1% just comes from lakes or nearby rivers. When we're looking at the lower capacity users, these are typically domestic wells, private wells, um, small commercial operations, 
These we don't have as, as good a handle on where the water use is coming from because they don't keep records of the, where that, the pumping conditions from those because they're typically less than a million gallons per year. But from just looking in, in the area, we, we have a feeling that it's approximately about 100% is from groundwater. Now, where is the groundwater coming from? And again, I think what we have to do is to look and, and see what the situation is, is to basically take um, a knife and slice through an area of the Northeast Metro. And, and I picked an area at White Bear Lake because that's where we've recently done our studies. So if we take a slice through and go down and, and look what, this, what the aquifer system looks like below White Bear Lake, White Bear Lake's in the blue at the top, but then right below that we have a lot of glacial material. It's called glacial till. A lot of it is sands and clays and other material that was deposited by the glaciers when they came through this area. But below that are some bedrock aquifers or aquifers of sandstone, limestone, and um, a variety of other sedimentary rocks that are much older than the glacial material. And in the area, um, directly below the glacial tills, we in a lot of areas we see the St. Peter sandstone. And then below that we have what's called the Prairie du Chien group and the Jordan sandstone. Now those two units make up a major aquifer in the area. And so when people are looking at putting in wells, they'll often put in a well and what you, what you can see is they'll, they'll try to key in on certain aquifers. If it's a major municipality, they try to get aquifers that, that provide a lot of water. And typically the Jordan and the Prairie du Chien provide a lot of water. If it's for a domestic purpose, for a, a house well or something, you may look at putting into a glacial material, some of the glacial sands, or maybe into the St. Peter sandstone. Now, if we look at the sources of water, where, where these, what it was heavily used in the area for the municipal wells or the high capacity wells, typically we look at the, the Prairie du Chien um, limestones and the Jordan sandstone. Pretty much 90% of the water from those sources comes from those two aquifers. There's a few wells that pump from well uh, uh, geologic units that are below the Prairie du Chien Jordan. That's the Tunnel City and the Wanawak formations. And some wells pump from even deeper wells uh, go into the Mount Simon sandstone. And it may be hard to see this, but uh, the picture on the left shows the Prairie du Chien and Jordan. It actually gets exposed at the surface, even though it's fairly deep here, it may be 300 feet in this area. You can actually see it exposed in, in Afton State Park. St. Peter sandstone, you can see this is bluff material that, that you can see along when you drive through St. Uh, through St. Paul and, and some of the bluff areas along St. Paul, you can see the St. Peter sandstone. Now, when we talk about the domestic wells, it's a different picture. We, there are wells that are taking water from the Prairie du Chien and the Jordan Aquifer, but there are just as many wells taking water from St. Peter sandstone aquifer, and even some that are taking water from the glacial aquifers from above. So it's kind of a mixed picture. Now, why are the lake levels um, in some lakes low and others are not. And this is a diagram we came up with looking at lake level changes from 2004 to 2011. And you can see one lake in particular, one in the middle of White Bear Lake, it's dropped more than four feet, it's actually dropped more than six feet um, since that time period. But there's other lakes in the area that, that have done similar. Um, Turtle Lake, Snail Lake have had issues. Um, I can show some of the the plots here. Here's the white for White Bear Lake in the middle. Turtle Lake has dropped. It's come back up, but now since August, this, this past August, it's gone back down. And Birch Lake, Birch Lake has also had issues, although it's recovered to some extent. But other lakes, uh, South School section, I'll point out, that one has dropped more than nine feet, and it hasn't recovered. It's still low. So what are the factors that kind of influence the lake levels? Well, there's a variety of factors. Um, there's certain physical characteristics of lakes that can can result that could, can result in the lake level changes, and also you, um, you can look at the lake. You have to look at the water balance components. What what are the sources? What are the sinks for water for a lake system? But then there's also human induced factors. Things like people can pump water into lakes, or people can pump water out of lakes, and those are all factors that you have to consider when looking at why a lake level is going up or a lake level is going down. Now, some of the physical characteristics. 
the area, the size, the area and volume of the lakes. The lakes that are larger, sometimes they tend to hold more water and, and can withstand larger changes in the, in the system. Whereas, also you have to look at the watershed area or the area that contributes water to the lake. Lakes that have much larger watersheds can maybe handle, uh, can have more stable levels than, wells that, uh, than lakes that have smaller watershed areas. Or for example, I'll give you an example, Bald Eagle Lake, that, that water level hasn't changed very much. Well, one reason why is the lake, the lake watershed is, is much larger than, for example, uh, White Bear Lake. When you look at lakes, a lot of times they'll talk about the watershed area versus the lake area for, for a, a lake system. For Bald Eagle Lake, the watershed area to lake area ratio is about 10 to 1, whereas White Bear, it's only 2 to 1. So it's a much smaller watershed for White Bear Lake to get water from, whereas Bald Eagle has much larger. Other factors include our rivers, streams, and ditches. Are they connected to lakes? Because the lakes that have those can also withstand, uh, can keep more stable water levels. Um, lakes that are, don't have um, ditches or rivers or streams connected, they're often called closed basin lakes, whereas well, well, rivers that, lakes that have rivers or streams or ditches are called open basin. <coughs> and finally, the groundwater connection. Is the lake connected to the groundwater system? How well is it connected? Is there a bunch of clay in between so it doesn't, the water from the groundwater doesn't feed into the lake very easily? Or is there a lot of sands so that the water can flow in? Okay, so when we talk about the lake water balance components, you have to look at all the factors involved. And you have to look at the inputs as well as the outputs. And, and the inputs are, you have precipitation, rainfall that can fall directly on the lake, but then you also have rainfall that can fall on the land surface and then run off into the lake, which is called sur surface runoff that can fall into the lake. You have evaporation off the lake that will take water off the lake. But then you also have plant transpiration. These are plants that are actually aquatic plants that are within the lake, lake itself or ones that are out along the, in the shorelines that can take water off the system. And, and those all have to be considered when looking at a lake level changes. Also, you have to look at the groundwater system. Groundwater can flow into a lake, but lake water can also leave a lake and, f and seep in into an aquifer and leave this lake system. And one example of looking at groundwater and how it may flow into a lake, you can see a, a typical example here at White Bear Lake. Um, if you go to the public beach, Monomedi Public Beach, you can actually see water that's seeping in along the, sh along the shoreline. And you can see some of it looks like a rust color to the system. And the reason why is that the groundwater that's coming in actually has a dissolved form of iron that's in the, w in the water. And the reason why it stays in there is because there's very little oxygen in the water. Well, once that water discharges along the shoreline, oxygen becomes available and the iron falls out of solution. And so you'll see these iron seeps. You can also see that by looking at uh, looking at temperature differences. And I know several people who I've talked with have always talked about swimming in White Bear Lake, and this is common with other lakes too, where they'll feel cold water in the summertime, really cool water in various locations. A lot of times those are places where you're getting groundwater flowing into the lake system. Now we said groundwater can flow into lakes, but also water can leave lakes and, and go into aquifer systems. And we had just completed a, a study on White Bear Lake, and one of the results we found was is that we could see through water chemistry that wells that are nearby White Bear Lake actually have <coughs> a mixture of surface water and groundwater coming into the lakes, uh, going into the wells, excuse me. And so what we've seen is that water along the shores are discharging into White Bear Lake, but then there's also water that's flowing from the lake seeping down, going into the deeper aquifer, which happens to be the Prairie Shing Jordan Aquifer. And then when that mixes with the aquifer water, which is coming from the northeast, it can then flow to, to the south and actually get taken up by wells. And when those wells take in that water, we're seeing from the chemistry signature in those, the well water that it's a mixture of, water, of surface water and groundwater why this is important is that 
pumping in the area from since 1980 has doubled. And so we are increasing the amount of water we're taking from that, the aquifer. And some of this flow is natural. So you'll get a natural flow that may be coming down into the from the lake into the aquifer. But when we stress the aquifer, we're pulling out more water, we're dropping the water levels, we're increasing the amount of water that may be leaving the lake. So these are factors we all have to consider when we're looking at the lake level change. Okay, to decrease water usage or encourage more efficient use, why not raise water usage rates? <laughs> well, uh, I thought that we're going to receive questions about the, the, the technical part of this, but it looks like everyone is asking questions about solutions, and we know that uh, you want us to, you want to steal our thunder from the next presentations, which is mainly about the solution. It's going to come very soon. So um, as, as of today, and, and this is just, I'm, I'm, I'm just mentioning this, as of today there is a bill in the House uh, this morning about increasing the water rates in, in, uh, in Minnesota. Uh, we don't, I don't know what's going to happen to that bill, but it's a bill introduced to increase the water fees in the, in the state of Minnesota. Mike, what is the history of the wells that used to pump water into the lake, Ramsey County Beach, Matasca Beach? The old lake augmentation wells, those particular ones, included a number of them we were able to convert over to observation wells so for the DNR's observation well network and the reason we like those is because they're very deep and they were we didn't have to drill them and pay to drill them but they were still available to us so a number of them were sealed over the years uh, I know in Hennepin County they sealed a lot of them in the 80s but the ones that we were able to get into our network we were able to keep and continue to measure water levels from so it's a combination of they've either been sealed or they've been converted over to an observation well. This one is for Perry. What municipalities' wells uh, showed White Bear Lake water in them? What municipalities' wells have the most effect on the water level of White Bear Lake? Oh, they gave me the good one. Hey, um, well, first of all, the wells that we found had, um, first of all, there, there were wells in the Prairie Shane Jordan, as well as there were some wells that were in the glacial aquifer between White, uh, between White Bear and Bald Eagle that showed a surface water component. And when we, did, we, when we looked at the data, we also looked at the water levels, which way the directions the water was flowing in the glacial aquifers as well as the Prairie du Chien Jordan aquifer. And what we saw was is that the wells that were to the south and down gradient of White Bear Lake uh, were the ones where we saw the, the greatest uh, con contribution of surface water. And that was in that Prairie du Chien Jordan Aquifer. And like I mentioned before, the glacial aquifers, we were, where we saw the signature of surface water was mostly between wells that were located between Bald Eagle and White Bear. So I wish I had a diagram to show you, but basically there's different flow patterns patterns in the groundwater system relative to what aquifer you're looking at in the White Bear Lake area. Ali, what plans do Twin Cities mayors, Met Council, USGS, Minnesota DNR have to work together to create water use policies and implement conservation measures? And in what time frame will they accomplish the above? Um, I think tonight's meeting is a good start for that. Uh, we have been working in the Metropolitan Council with all the agencies, and, 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 and actually this, this workshop uh, is, is, uh, is a result of hard work from so many individuals in the communities, as well as agencies in the area, uh, all the way to the state and uh, the federal level, USGS, DNR, us in this uh, Metropolitan Council, in addition to the locals who are been working very hard in, uh, I, I was really impressed with the, uh, the concerned citizens who started all of this uh, work together, putting together the first group to 
tackle the problem of the lake and, and then looking beyond that into what are the conservation measures and all of that. Um, just to let you know, there is a group right now working, which is the Lake Resolution Committee, and, and, and that's part of that work is conservation. And truly, there is no time to start conservation. We need to start it yesterday. Uh, so I think many of, the, many of the municipalities are aware of that. Many of the municipalities are starting conservation programs. I understand White Bear Lake, uh, City of White Bear Lake, they have implemented water conservation programs for the last five, ten years. And that's starting, they started to see some uh, improvement in the water use in the area. And other cities around the metro area, we started seeing them implementing conservation uh, programs. Uh, one of the things we would like to tell you that there, there is going to be one of the, those series that we are going to conduct in the future is going to be mainly about conservation. And, and that's going to be targeted to municipalities as well as private citizens, where they how to learn how I can reduce my water bill in my house. Uh, in addition, how the city can fix some of the problems that can lead to reduction in their water use. So I think uh, you guys are ahead of us in asking all of those questions, but uh, hopefully we'll come back uh, in less than a month or so uh, with some of those um, conservation. Uh, I, I know that for sure we have a series about conser conservation in the metro area. And I, I do know that um, Ali mentioned the Lake Resolution Committee for the White Bear Lake Conservation District Board. And I know that uh, we have several members of that Lake Resolution Committee in the audience here. Um, and that it's my understanding that they are, have or are soon to be making recommendations for conservation, um, some short-term, interim, and longer-term, of course, conservation is a part of all of that, um, and that that should be coming relatively soon. Uh, for Mike, where and when will the DNR report aquifer levels? Well, currently, the DNR has a website with all of our observation well data. And we have 800 wells around the state that we collect water levels from. And we have approximately 150 in the metro area of various aquifers. And that is available, those levels are available on our website. The work that we've been doing, if you looked at the map over here in conjunction or in, in continuation of what Perry worked on, is a report that's going to be worked on. And we don't have any of it available now because we're just still continuing to collect data. But I'm I'm hoping we get a report out on kind of what we found on the water levels that we've been measuring in our mass measurements, our synoptics. But for long-term aquifer information, the DNR's website, the Observation Well Network, will show you where our wells are, and then you can look at the water levels anywhere from some of them are six or seven years worth of data, and some of them have about six months worth of data. It just depends on how long the well has been measured by us. For Perry, if the water in Wiper Lake is seeping into the aquifer, what impact does that ha have on the water quality of the aquifer? Well, it, it, it all depends on how much water is entering the aquifer, how much water is present in the aquifer. It's sometimes dilution is the solution, they say. Sometimes you, you get enough water in the aquifer that's present so that when lake water is seeping through, that you don't notice a difference in the water quality. But it can be significant. It just depends on how much water is seeping in and how much of a difference there is in the chemistry that's the lake water versus what's in the aquifer itself. Uh, I think for the most part, we looked at the water chemistry in White Bear Lake um, and compared it to the Prairie du Chien Jordan Aquifer, and they were quite similar. There wasn't a large number of differences, however, the chloride values are starting to increase in the lake. Um, some of that may be due to road salting, uh, associated with road salting, but that water, some of that may mix in and eventually go into the deeper aquifer. But, the, but as, as you have to look at the system, you have to look at how much water is actually seeping into the aquifer, how much water is presently in the aquifer, and it all becomes a balance to see what the system looks like. Uh, 
Ali, what are the pros and cons to taking more water out of the rivers? I think you guys are asking about solutions at this point. And so again, you know, you are, you are taking from our presentation for the next uh, series. But uh, I will start saying some stuff about the reality of, and some background information about how much surface water we have in the metro area. We have three main rivers. Those three main rivers run about, flows about four trillion gallons a year. Currently, in the Minneapolis system, the St. Paul system, they're using only 2% of that available flow. We have 98% that's not utilized. And um, one of the things I came from a state, I came from California to work here. And, and, and in California, we're not gonna let that such an opportunity to go by. You have water available, use surface water when it's available, leave groundwater for the drought time. And that's, that's a rule in many places in California that they have been using. Some of the issues, we have our groundwater systems or currently the municipalities that's using groundwater systems. They built their system so that you have your well and then you build from the well your distribution system. This is different in the surface water. Surface water they bring, or the two sur main surface water that we have here, they have already big main lines and then people take from those main lines. For us in cities like around the area here, who are using groundwater, you have six wells, and then you can think about them as six individual distribution systems, where all of those people in living in this area near this well are gonna be connected to that well. So there's gonna be a lot of infrastructure to turn from groundwater to surface water. That's, we're not equipped in the metro area at this point to do that. Uh, water quality and water treatment, that's another issue. Uh, cost of water treatment is a big, big factor here. Um, in many places here around the metro area, we don't treat groundwater. And most of the treatment happen at your home. You have a softener, and that take care of most of the treatment you are having. Some of the cities, they treat groundwater uh, because they have some uh, uh, minerals in that, and they have to treat it so, to the drinking water standard. But most of the cities who use groundwater, they don't treat, and that's why groundwater is cheaper. Uh, infrastructure wise also for surface water if, if you are you want to expand it for long distances you have to tap into the rivers and, and, and it's just going to be extra cost so in general one of the biggest issues we are dealing with is cost and uh, I think that's what prevent a lot of the communities of taking surface water Mike, is there a lot of variety in the impermeability? impermeability, thank you, <laughs> of aquatards? Yes, there is. And actually, the Minnesota Geological Survey is doing a study right now on the St. Lawrence uh, unit, which is considered an aqua, aqua confining layer, an aquatard. And they're finding that maybe it's not as impermeable as we thought, meaning water can get through it easier than we thought. And that may be true. We've never really studied it, so they're starting to study it. But different systems have different physical characteristics, and they even depend across the, the, per, the length of the system. So yes, they do. We used up all your questions, Perry, but you can, no. uh, you know, feel you free to jump in any time. <laughs> okay. Uh, I can, I can uh, answer. There's one. Go ahead. I think I, I didn't answer one of the questions fully. I think one had to do with water levels and um, which ones are impacting with the city, which would show that which municipal wells may be impacting the lake more than others. And what we did with our first study was really collect a lot of information that we can use to develop a groundwater flow model that then we can really look at seeing if we put in various pumping conditions in, in the municipalities as well as the other wells in the area we can see which wells where the water flowing is exactly flowing from White Bear Lake and which wells may be impacting the lake more than others and that's something we're hoping to do we're hoping to get some funding um, through the state to actually continue that work
Okay, the next question is for Ali, and I think you're going to see a, a common theme here is that um, the folks in this room really are looking for solutions. <laughs> um, and and, and I, I do want to point out that um, the folks coming here tonight, some had a lot of information and some had very little and wanted to, we wanted to give a base, as I said at the very beginning, we wanted to give a base of education to figure out, okay, now that you've got that, what are the possible solutions? They are being worked on. I just want to assure you of that. We have things going on at the Lake Resolution Committee, within the community, within the Chamber of Commerce. I know that they are looking at getting businesses involved. Um, but we will be coming back and um, trying to really vet those things as well so that we can get, get us to the next step. So with all the complex components involved with water levels, is there a starting point with how to resolve the issues of water shortage? And in conjunction with that, um, have other states run into this problem? And if so, have their solutions to this problem been examined as to their use towards solutions for Minnesota? I will start with the second question. I came from working in Minnesota, in, in New Mexico and California. So we have seen a lot of worse than this problem. Uh, we have seen problems where aquifers went down, wells went dry, and uh, regulations imposed by the federal government not to pump more water from the aquifers because they are impacting downstream users, uh, they're impacting everyone in the aquifer and so on. So other states are facing some of those challenges and they have been facing them for a long time. Um, the only difference that for a long time they realized the limitation of the resource and, and I think that's what we really need to start realizing here. Uh, we have limited resources. Uh, we were lucky that we have abundant abundance of our groundwater, but still it's a limited resource. And if you go in different parts of the metro area, you see that some places they have more productive aquifers than other places. And so um, dealing with all of those issues, it's, it's I think one of the first starting places is conservation. Uh, it's, it's on different levels, on the municipality level as well as the individual level. And, and this is, I think, for a long time, coming from outside of the state. When I first started in, in Minnesota here, I started seeing people are paying more attention to the quality, the quality of our water, the quality of our lakes, and all of that. But sooner, we found out that the quantity is another problem. And for a long time, quantity was not the issue that we are dealing with in the state. So I think the, question, the first question is, where do we start? Start by ourselves, conservation. We have to be uh, aware of how much we are using and how much we are wasting. Uh, that's a very good start. There is a lot of resources out there. Metropolitan Council website, go to our website. You have a lot of information about how to conserve in your house, how municipalities conserve in their, in, in, in their business. That's a good start. Department of Natural Resources, they have a similar uh, direction in their website. So it's, it's very easy to get information, to get informed about how you can do it yourself. And one of the biggest obstacles we face with conservation, people think that, okay, I'm going to conserve, but what that will do? Think about it of if 60,000 people start conserving, what the impact will be in our uh, water use in, in the metro area. That's, I'm saying 60,000, this is probably the new population who is coming to the met northeast metro area. Mike, if you could please speak to the impact, if any, of use of geothermal heating and cooling. On the aquifer systems, water quality, water levels, it really doesn't make much of an impact because a lot of the geothermal systems that are being installed are what they call closed loop. So it's just kind of antifreeze cycling through the well, within the well, and it never gets into the aquifer. So there isn't, isn't generally an impact of any type onto the aquifer itself. Um, Ali, I think this one was for you. The city of San Antonio, Texas implemented water conservation measures and reported in 2011 or 2012 that the conservation measures, measures reduced water usage to levels in 1991. Would you consider researching the San Antonio, Texas model and implementing it here? 
uh, will be more than happy to see how they have done that. Uh, we're looking into other uh, other cities that have more similarity than like what we have here in, in the Midwest. Uh, sometimes uh, the cities in the West, Western United States, they have more severe droughts and more severe problems than what, that what we have here, and they have to go into very drastic measures uh, on conservation. But I think there is so many cities around us here in the Midwest who have been implementing very successful conservation programs, even within the state of Minnesota. Uh, there is a lot of cities who have been uh, uh, implementing very successful programs, and that can be seen in their water use. Uh, we'll be more than happy to look into that and, and see how they have done that. Mike, uh, how does fracking affect aquifers? Well, nobody does fracking in Minnesota. So in this part of the country, it isn't really a problem. Fracking, when, when we hear fracking in Minnesota, it's usually the mining of the frac type, the sands that they use to do hydraulic fracking. And we have a, a sample of it, the Jordan sandstone is what they're mining here. And the impacts to aquifers from the mining activities are just like what you would typically expect from a sand and gravel or any other type of mining activity. But here in Minnesota, nobody is doing hydraulic fracking. Well, we're getting the signals from the back here that um, we have to wrap this up. And so I would just like to um, talk a little bit about what is to come. Uh, that we, have, we plan to have two more meetings in this series. We're hoping to hold our next meeting in June, and I'm fairly confident, although not totally, that we won't have snow at that time, but <laughs> we'll do our best. With that, uh, again, I would like to thank all of you for coming and thank our co-hosts and um, have a good evening.